Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you are new here, welcome. Please consider subscribing if you end up liking this video. Okay, so today we're gonna to be talking about the Carney cult. Have you ever heard of this one? This one sort of got buried over the years. You don't hear too many people talking about it, which is shocking because a cult of Carnies, it just sounds super creepy. This case took place in the early 90s during the times of the satanic panic and it just added fuel to the fire. The satanic panic was a social phenomenon that was centered around conspiracy theories involving the existence of satanic cults committing widespread abuse throughout the United States. This all really started in the early 80s and it lasted well into the 90s. And during this time, there were hundreds, maybe even thousands of false allegations that led to the wrongful convictions of innocent people. The West Memphis Three case, which most of you have probably heard of, is one of the most notable examples of what the satanic panic caused within the justice system. Today, the West Memphis Three walked free. Three outcasts with mullets and dark clothing who dabbled in the occult. Convicted in what many labeled a literal witch hunt, no physical evidence against them. We were innocent and they sent us to prison for the rest of our lives. And the men who were involved in this cult, the Carney cult, they became the literal embodiment of what the public feared the most at that time. It was as if they had plucked the mental image of a Satanist right out of the mind of an average American at that time. And they worked as hard as they could to emulate that image. I'd really like to one day do an entire video all about the satanic panic because it really was wild. Now there aren't a lot of details out there on this case. That's why this video is a little shorter than my normal uploads. And there are also very few photos, but as usual, I have done my best to add in as much as I possibly can. And with all of that being said, let's go ahead and jump into the case. But before we do, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Casetify. I've been using Casetify phone cases for years now, well before they sponsored my channel, well before I even had a channel. And I love these phone cases. They truly are the best hands down. Anyone who knows me can tell you what a klutz I am. I can't even count how many phone screens and camera lenses that I've cracked in the past. I would always choose style over protection and I'd end up buying those like cheap little flimsy cases that looked cute but didn't really offer any protection. But once I discovered Casetify, I realized that I could finally have the best of both worlds. I could have a case that spoke to my interest and my style while also protecting my phone with military grade protection, which I desperately needed. Lately, I've been switching back and forth between in a couple of different cases, just depending on what mood I'm in. Today, I'm actually using one of my new favorites. It's the clear case. And I love this one for just like a classic, simple, clean look. I've had clear cases in the past, but they would always end up turning yellow over time. But what I love about this one is that Casetify uses their UV Defender technology to prevent that yellowing. There are so many options in these clear cases too, and you can even customize them if you want. This case has been drop tested at 6.6 .6 feet. So I know when I eventually drop my phone, it's gonna be protected even after a big fall. It's also MagSafe compatible and the side buttons are still super easy to press. They don't feel squishy, they don't feel rigid. It honestly feels like I don't even have a phone case on when I'm pressing the volume buttons. Casetify also offers lots of accessories like this utility strap that's really easy to attach to your phone. And one of my favorite things about this case is that it's made from 65% recycled and plant-based materials. If you're interested in trying out the clear case or any of the other many, many cases that Casetify has to offer, go to casetify.com slash Summer Sanchez to get 15% off your order. Or you can check my description box for that link. Thanks again to Casetify for sponsoring this video. And now let's jump back into the case. We are opening up today's case in Franklin, Indiana in the early to mid 1980s. A boy named Mark Goodwin is attending Custer Baker Middle School. Not much is known about Mark's childhood except that he became very interested in the occult and Satanism during his time in middle school at around age 12. It was during this time that Mark became drawn to what most people at that time would consider dark culture. He listened to Ozzy Osbourne and more specifically, he would listen to Ozzy's album, Diary of a Mad man on repeat. Now Ozzy was mentioned a lot during the height of the satanic panic because of his dark lyrics and his mentions of the devil. In fact, in a very long 1988 episode of the Geraldo Rivera show called Devil Worship Exposing Satan's Underground, Ozzy actually made an appearance and he was questioned by Geraldo about taking responsibility for all of these Satanists that were infesting America. There is no doubt, at least not in our reporting, that, say, uh, that heavy metal music plays a role. I see tattoos of your name on some of these uh, you know, teenage devil worshippers' arms. 
wherever I see devil graffiti and satanic graffiti, I see your name also. Do you feel a sense of responsibility, Oz? Do you feel responsible? I don't, I don't, feel, I don't feel guilty. I feel um, kind of persecuted by everybody because I'm not a bad guy. I'm, I'm, it, my intentions are not to harm anyone. In fact, it's, it's directly the opposite. Dark music doesn't make people murder. Video games do not make people murder. Scary movies do not make people murder. Like, Ozzy can't be blamed for the things that Mark goes on to do. There was obviously a deeper issue there. So when Mark was only 12, he started looking into the meaning behind some satanic symbols that he had seen on an album cover, such as an inverted cross and pentagram. From there, he started reading pretty much any type of literature that he could find on the occult and Satanism, including the Satanic Bible by Anton LaVey. And eventually Mark became fully obsessed and he began to adopt this religion. But he quickly realized that there weren't many kids around him who shared these same beliefs, so he made it his quest to find and surround himself with people who held his same beliefs and interests. And Mark's family did not like this new interest at all. Especially his father, he completely condemned the whole thing. Some of Mark's other family members would express their concern about his religion, but they sort of resolved to just let Mark be Mark and just work through this phase. Other members of his family just completely disowned him. But the rift that this was all causing within his family did not deter Mark in his quest to go deeper into Satanism and to meet like-minded people. And by the time he was 15, he had managed to find a small group of like-minded people and he and this group pretty much hung out all the time. The age ranges of these people is concerning. They were between the ages of 12 and 35 years old. I can't think of one good reason a 35 year old would want to hang out with a bunch of children. And this little detail becomes even more disturbing when you hear about the rituals that take place, which we'll talk about in a minute. Now in their group, the number of male members greatly outweighed the number of female members. Mark's reasoning for this was that girls just aren't as open to Satanism as guys are. Mark came to view heaven the way most people viewed hell and vice versa. Mark said he would much rather be in hell where he believed you could quote, make it what you want, your own version of paradise. Mark also believed that by devoting his life to the devil, he would gain ultimate power over people. And this this was the most appealing aspect of his belief system. He really wanted to have control over others, which explains why it was Mark who was named priest when he and his friends formed a cult, which they called Satan's Disciples. And now I do need to give a quick warning because we're coming up on the animal cruelty stuff. So like I said, Mark Goodwin is now the priest of Satan's Disciples. And according to Mark, he and the others would take part in various rituals. Late at night, they would all meet up in random barns near their little town of Franklin, or sometimes they would meet in densely wooded areas. And then sometimes they would meet up in an old abandoned cemetery near Martinsville. And this is where they would conduct their rituals. But before we talk about the rituals, let's discuss the required attire in the cult. So the boys and men would all dress in long black ceremonial robes. You know, the ones, those cliche black robes that most people think of when they hear the words Satan worshiper. While the girls and women weren't allowed to wear robes, they were required to wear either black lingerie or nothing at all. They could opt to just be naked. So once everyone had gathered in that night's chosen spot, all dressed in their required attire, the ritual would begin. They would start by lighting candles all around the area and they would heavily consume alcohol, maybe even drugs, I'm not sure, but by the end of it, they were all completely wasted except from Mark. Mark would remain completely sober during the ritual. Mark would draw a pentagram on the ground, then everyone would start chanting what Mark referred to as an invocation to Satan that would conjure up demons to do their bidding. And then a blood sacrifice would be made. Using a knife, the group would kill a cat and then drain its blood into a ceremonial chalice. And then they would all take turns drinking from the chalice. And then everyone in the cult would participate in an orgy. According to Mark, everyone in the group would have sex with each other. There were no rules and no limits. This ritual is messed up enough without me reminding you of the ages of these members while all this is happening, but I will still remind you that they are between the ages of 12 and 35. So just think about that. So the group just carried on like this for the next few years, but then some of the members started talking about ramping up these rituals by sacrificing an innocent such as a baby. And when Mark heard this, it really freaked him out. He 
was like, okay, I'm done. He apparently still had his limits at this time, and this was like way out of bounds for him. He said, quote, to kill a kid for a ritual that lasts maybe three hours and the kid's life is gone for good, it's pointless. And at age 18, Mark left Satan's disciples. And I don't know what happened to this group after Mark left. I don't know if they disbanded or found a new leader, but as far as we know, no babies were ever harmed. So once Mark left the cult, he found himself alone. He had been surrounded by his cult members for years at this point, and now they were gone. This is when Mark decided that he needed to patch things up with his family. But that wasn't going to happen unless he let go of his religious beliefs, or at least pretended to let go of them. So Mark told his parents that he was done with Satanism. He said, quote, I hid my religion so I wouldn't disappoint them because of the way society based it. I pretended to change so I would have a place to sleep. The information on this case doesn't mention when Mark left his family home, but he must have either moved out or been thrown out at some point in his teens. But now that he has seemingly denounced Satanism, he has been allowed to move back into his family's home. And for the next two years, Mark hid his true beliefs from everyone. He didn't conduct rituals. He didn't form or join any cults. Outwardly, he seemed as if all the Satan stuff was behind him. But that, of course, was not actually the case. In 1991, when Mark is about 20 years old, he gets a job at a local fast food restaurant in the city of Greenwood, Indiana. And unfortunately, this is where he meets the Lawrence brothers. David and Keith Lawrence both worked at the fast food restaurant as well. David was the older brother, and he was about 21 or 22 at this point, and Keith Lawrence was about 18 or 19. And the dynamic between these two brothers was very unhealthy. Keith took on the role as the leader, even though though he was the younger of the two brothers, and David just seemed to sort of follow Keith around and just go along with whatever he wanted. And like Mark, Keith had become very interested in witchcraft and Satanism at a very young age. He researched the religion for years, thoroughly, and according to David, chances were if you were looking for literature on Satanism, his brother Keith had it. Keith strived to become what David called a Satanic philosopher. Keith grew into a very hateful, angry, violent teen and he hated the fact that David was not a part of his religion. And one time he got so upset about David's refusal to get involved with Satanism that he grabbed one of the family's kitchen knives and tried to attack David with it. He literally chased him all around the house, seemingly trying to kill him. And after this, Keith was sent away to a private school in Terre Haute, Indiana. His parents just kind of hoped that it would straighten him out. But when he returned from school, nothing had really changed and his religion religious beliefs definitely had not changed. And despite everything Keith had done, David still hung around him. David said that their parents didn't really talk to them that much. And so when Keith was sent off to private school, he was really lonely. So when Keith returned, David just resolved to just accept his brother's beliefs and not challenge him. And they actually became very close and they ended up spending most of their time together. David said, quote, he was the only family member that would talk to me with respect. That was the only reason I ever hung around him. A satanic brother is all I had. I don't know how the whole knife attack thing fit in with the respect, but either way, David and Keith were always together. In 1991, the Lawrence brothers started working at the same fast food restaurant as Mark Goodwin, and this is how they all met. One day while they were working, Mark noticed that Keith is wearing a necklace with a pentagram on it. So Mark asked Keith about this, and Keith ended up opening up about his beliefs and ideas, and Mark was immediately impressed with everything Keith was saying. Remember, Keith thought of himself as a satanic philosopher. So he was saying all of these, you know, very existential kind of things. This all really intrigued Mark. And in that one chance meeting, Mark fell right back into all of his old ways. Mark and Keith wrote up a contract with Satan signing over their souls. They believed that this contract would grant them anything they wanted for the next 20 years. And then after that time, Satan could do whatever he wanted with them. He could even kill them. They didn't care. And of course, they signed this contract with their own blood. David was present when the contract was written and signed, but he did not take part in it. He was always just sort of around. Mark and Keith and David would go to cemeteries and conduct seances where they would unsuccessfully try to communicate with the dead. Again, David was present for this, but he did not participate. So as time went on, Mark and Keith went further and further into their religion and their families started to notice and they didn't like it. And soon there was a lot of fighting happening within the Goodwin and Lawrence 
Lawrence households. And by May of 1991, they were all on the verge of being kicked out of their homes. So to escape the tension at home, Mark, Keith, and David decided to join the carnival circuit. They signed with an amusement company and this would allow them to travel all throughout Indiana and Ohio with the carnivals. And now that they are no longer under the watchful eye of their families, Mark and Keith decided to form another cult. And this is unfortunately when they meet another carnival worker, 24 year old Jimmy Lee Pinnock. And I don't know a lot about Jimmy's childhood either. All I know is that he was from Shelbyville, Indiana, and he came from a very abusive home. And by the time Jimmy joined the carnival circuit, he already had a very extensive criminal record and his crimes would only escalate from here. So when Jimmy meets Mark, Keith, and David, he tells them that he's also a Satanist. So he's permitted into their cult. So the four of them just travel with the carnival companies all throughout parts of Indiana and Ohio. And in their free times, they meet up for Satan stuff. They eventually become acquainted with another carnival worker, 21 year old William Anthony Olt. Anthony Olt was also very interested in Satanism, but he was not in the cult. He really wanted to join the cult, but for unknown reasons, they did not want him joining. Now, Jimmy seemingly sort of becomes the cult's leader after a while. This likely had something to do with all of his previous crimes and the fact that he was a little bit older than everyone else in the group. And this is not good because as it turns out, Jimmy Lee Pinnock is a very dangerous and violent person. And this all becomes very apparent on August 30th, 1991, one day before the start of the Fulton County Fair. An 18 year old carnival worker from West Milton, Ohio named Andrew Wright was found stabbed to death in a field near the Ohio Turnpike. It turns out that Jimmy Lee Pinnock with the help of his fellow cult member, Keith Lawrence, murdered Andrew Wright because Wright had allegedly talked to other people in the carnival circuit about Jimmy's involvement in some past crimes in Ohio. So Jimmy and Keith managed to lure Andrew out all by himself, and then they slit his throat and stabbed him to death and left him there in the field. Now in the beginning, no one connected Jimmy and Keith to Andrew's murder. So the only ones who knew about it were the members of the cult and Anthony Olt. And it is alleged that Anthony used his knowledge of the murder as a leverage in order to be admitted into the cult. Olt was said to be someone who was just looking for companionship and he wanted to be a part of this close group of friends. And he was desperate to officially be let into the inner circle of this cult because so far he had just been kept on the periphery. Then about a month after the murder of Andrew Wright, Jimmy and the others finally relented and they agreed to let Alt join their group. But they told him that first he would need to go through initiation, which involved this very elaborate ritual. And of course, Anthony agrees to go along with whatever. The group enlisted the help of their friend, Brenda Ferguson, to find an appropriate place where they could conduct this ritual. And Brenda finds the perfect spot. So once the carnival was finally shut down for the night at the DeKalb County Free Fair on September 25th, 1991, Brenda picks up the five men and drops them off in front of an old secluded farm building near Auburn, Indiana. And this would be the site of the initiation, except it wasn't going to be an initiation. This was going to be a sacrifice. Anthony Alt was brought into the farm building where there was an old door, which was set up like an altar. He was told to lie down on the door and then he was bound and gagged. Then Keith Lawrence began reading an invocation to Satan while Jimmy Pinnock using one of Keith's knives made a deep cut from Alt's neck all the way down his abdomen. Then Keith, David, and Mark all took turns making additional cuts until they had carved an inverted cross into Anthony Alt's chest and abdomen. Then according to Jimmy Pinnock, Mark Goodwin attempted to cut Anthony Alt's heart right out of his chest. And all of this is happening while Anthony is still alive and conscious. Jimmy then leaned in close to Anthony Alt's ear and asked him if he was ready to die. Anthony did whisper something back, but it's unknown what he said. But Jimmy's response was to slit open Anthony's throat, which ultimately killed him. Once the men were sure that Anthony Alt was dead, they then picked up the door that he was lying on and moved him outside into the open field. Then they cut off Anthony's head and hands and then attempted to burn them in the field in order to conceal his identity. Now the head wasn't just removed to conceal his identity. According to Jimmy Pinnock, the head was also removed so that Keith Lawrence 
could give the skull to a friend. But I guess he decided against that at the last minute because the head was later found with the other remains. Maybe he didn't want Brenda Ferguson to see when she came to pick them up. I don't know. Or maybe he planned to leave the head out in the elements long enough for the flesh to fall off and then he was going to come back to get it. I don't know. But either way, the head was left there in the field with the other remains. And once everything was done, Brenda Ferguson came back out to the farm to pick them up. And I'm sure you're all wondering what Brenda Ferguson's role was in all of this. Like how much was she involved? How much did she know? And I could not find a clear answer. Some sources refer to Brenda as a friend of theirs, while other sources say that she was an accomplice, which the word accomplice would imply that she knowingly took part in the murder in some way. The men did say that she didn't know anything about it, which could totally be the case. However, she dropped off five men at the farm that night, but when she came back to get them, there were only four and they were in a very secluded area. So did she question like where Anthony Olt had gone and they dismembered his body? Surely they had blood on them when she picked them up, unless they somehow cleaned up afterwards. There are a lot of questions that I have about this whole thing. So I don't know really what Brenda's involvement was in the murder, but what I I do know is that after Brenda picked the guys up at the farm, they all headed to their local Arby's and treated themselves to some dinner using the money they had stolen from Anthony Alt's pocket after they murdered him. And then the four men just returned to their carnival jobs like nothing had ever happened. And this part just really creeps me out because these murderers were just hanging out, just working at carnivals, places where families and children visit every day. And none of those people knew that these carnies had just committed a torture killing. By October 1991, the carnival season was ending in Indiana. Jimmy Pinnock returned home to Shelbyville, while Mark, David, and Keith headed south to Florida looking for winter carnival jobs that would be starting up soon. The three of them drove down to Florida in Keith's old beat up van, which he had named Rigor Mortis. Then in November of 1991, the carnival company that the men worked for broke up into units, which caused the three of them to split up. The Lawrence brothers ended up in the Bahamas working in carnivals there while Mark landed in Hollywood, Florida. And once the cult was totally disbanded and Mark Goodwin was away from the others, it seems as though his conscience finally got the best of him. And on December 12th, 1991, Mark called his father and confessed that he had witnessed a ritualistic torture killing of a man in DeKalb County. Mark's father wasted no time going to the police with this information that his son had given him. And on December 13th, police found the dismembered body of Anthony Alt, including a skull and hand bone fragments. On December 30th, 1991, police arrested Mark Goodwin at his home in Indianapolis soon after he had returned home from his carnival job in Florida. And he was charged with conspiracy to commit murder. And the very same day that Mark was arrested, Jimmy Lee Pinnock was also arrested at his home in Shelbyville and charged with murder. Pinnock eventually confessed to killing Anthony Olt, admitting that he had been the one to make the initial and final cuts that had killed Anthony. But in the beginning, Mark Goodwin was only confessing that he had witnessed the murder. He wasn't willing to go any further than that. Both of the men told the police about the Lawrence brothers' involvement as well, and warrants were put out for their arrest, but they were still on that carnival job in the Bahamas. But on January 10th, 1992, the Lawrence brothers unknowingly got on a plane to Miami, Florida. And once they arrived at the Miami airport, customs officials were waiting for them and they were arrested and extradited to Indiana to face charges of aiding in a murder. After some questioning, police believed that the motive for killing Anthony was to keep him quiet about the murder of Andrew Wright. All of the men ended up pleading guilty to various charges eventually. And while they were in prison awaiting their sentencing hearings, David Lawrence and Mark Goodwin both spoke out about how much they he regretted getting involved in the cult. David claimed that he never considered himself a Satanist. He was just a guy who felt like he had to follow his brother down whatever dark path he went on. In the end, Keith Lawrence pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit murder and he was given an eight to 30 year sentence followed by 20 years of probation. David Lawrence pleaded guilty to assisting a criminal and he was given an eight year sentence. Mark Goodwin pleaded guilty to assisting a criminal and battery committed by means of a deadly weapon and he was given given eight years for each charge, but he got to serve them concurrently, which does not sound like enough of a sentence for Mark, does it? If he really did attempt 
to cut out Anthony Alt's heart while he was still alive, he deserved so much longer, in my opinion. Anthony Alt's mother, Shirley Givens, was present during Mark's sentencing hearing. And during the hearing, Mark stood up and made a statement saying, quote, Mrs. Givens, I never really knew your son. Whatever I know, I do know he was a good hearted person. I am very ashamed of what I did to your son. And Shirley Givens wasn't having any of that bullshit. She yelled out, quote, you damn well should be. What chance does he have now? What am I supposed to feel? Sorry for you. You never should have done it. Mark ended up converting to Christianity while he was in prison. And in a 1992 news article, he is quoted saying, Satanism can be dangerous. Look at the situation me and the other guys are facing. Look at William Anthony Alt. He was a Satanist, but he didn't make it. Which is honestly sickening that he even said that. Anthony Olt didn't make it because four terrible people decided to torture and kill him to keep him quiet. Jimmy Lee Pinnock pleaded guilty to murder and he received the most severe punishment. In exchange for his confessions and a guilty plea, the death penalty was taken off the table and he was given a 60 year prison sentence. Pinnock also pleaded guilty to the murder of Andrew Wright and he was given a sentence of 20 years to life in an Ohio court. And he did try to appeal these sentences in December of 1995, but it was denied. Keith Lawrence was released from prison after serving less than 15 years, and he began his 20-year probation in 2006. He had earned two college degrees while he was in prison, and he had a really good behavior record, so he ended up being released very early. And his probation was even eased from mandatory in-home detention for the first five years to just regular probation since the county that he was living in with his parents didn't have an in-home detention program. But then in November of 2006, Keith was arrested and pleaded guilty to charges of public intoxication and he was sentenced to 180 days in jail. The same news article I found on this also stated that he was charged with two felony counts of criminal confinement and battery, but both of those charges were dismissed. And I would love to know more about those two felony counts, but I couldn't find any other information on that. And that was the very messed up case of the Carney cult murders. Let me know what you guys think about this one. Let me know if you've ever heard of this one. Thanks again to Case Defy for sponsoring this video. And don't forget that you can find the link to get 15% off of your order in my description box. If you found this video interesting, please consider subscribing to my channel and following me on Instagram at summer underscore Sanchez YT. As always, I appreciate each and every one of you watching and I will see you next time.